Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Zandi, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, uh, trusty co-hosts, Marissa Di Natale and Chris Dorides. Hi, guys. Hi, hey, Mark. So what's going on? What's going on uh, in your part of the world? And Marissa, you're out in the... Oh, Marissa, you're, are you getting inundated by rain out there in Southern California? It's been raining basically since Christmas, <laughs> and uh, it stopped yesterday. And we're supposed to get another storm this weekend. Where I am in Southern California by the beach, it hasn't been that bad. We haven't had flooding like further north where it's been terrible. So things are green here. It's oh, kind of wow. nice. I don't yeah. think I've ever seen it green in Southern California. Yeah, yeah. It, it gets green in the winter because this is when we get rain. Just huh. like two weeks around Christmas, we get rain and then don't see it again for the rest of the year. No, is it just me? But I, I don't really hear any conversation around, around what this all means for the drought. I mean, it, what, what does it mean for the drought? Anything at all? Or? Not much, Not apparently. Much. So uh -huh. um, there are big reservoirs that attempt to catch or, capture rainwater uh, around the state, and they've filled up a bit, but it's not put that much of a dent in it, I guess. Mm. I heard the snowpack, though, is... The snowpack is like a record. Um, so, oh, so yeah, I think, that, I think that'll help. I right. think it remains to be seen, but so I've seen some things that say that this could bring us through the next year. Um, but I don't, I don't know. It depends how much they can capture. Hmm. Well, I was hearing stories of they're, they're finding bodies in reservoirs now. The water's so low, but that does sound scary. Oh, like Lake Mead? Lake Mead. Right, and, right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and, and Chris, uh, how are things in, uh, you holding down the fort there in suburban Philly? Yeah, a little bit uh, typical gray uh, day here, but uh, all good. I had a, I had an event yesterday in Philadelphia. I spoke to the Philadelphia Business Journal at an event, and I had to oh, actually- Oh, that was Pat Harker was there, wasn't he? The president of the Philly Fed? Didn't he speak at that? No? I, he spoke last year. I, I stood in for him. Oh, you stood? Oh, you, oh okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, I had to actually commute from Westchester, PA, down to Philadelphia. And I can appreciate why folks don't want to commute out yeah. to our house. It's yeah. uh, it eye-opening, right? It's, uh, the traffic. Traffic was uh, pretty terrible. Yeah. It was raining, so there were a couple accidents. So Yeah. I think uh, this remote work thing might be here to that... stay. Did you see that article that said that the traffic in Philadelphia is worse than the traffic in LA? No, no. Yeah, they did a traffic it, study across across all the major metro areas, and they said the traffic in Philly is now worse than the traffic in LA. How's that possible? That just doesn't feel right. I'll uh, send you the link. Yeah, could you? Yeah. yeah. All right, I'd be very curious well, on that. I'm waiting for those infrastructure funds to to kick in here. We hopefully we get our fair share in in, in Philly. Um, well, very good. Um, and we have a guest, David Wessel. David, good, good to see you. Good to see you, Mark and yeah. Marissa and Chris. Yeah. And you, I, I see you had made your way into the office there in DC. You're at the Brookings Institution. And, uh, how do you feel about remote work? Are you, we have this question to everybody who comes on. Um, I think that I don't like coming in every day. This has been a, an unusual week where I had to come in every day, and this morning I almost didn't make it. Uh, but I think that for my team, uh, having being here two or three days a week has proved very successful. And uh, I think without that, we we lack the kind of serendipity, and especially for our younger staff. I have to say that, like, yesterday was one of the coolest days I've had at Brookings. Mm. Um, I have the honor of having Ben Bernanke part of our team, mm -hmm. and he brought in to show us his twelve thousand dollar gold Nobel Prize and passed oh, it cool. on the lunch uh. table yesterday. So I was thinking, like, okay, this does make worth make it worthwhile coming downtown. Yeah, that does sound cool. Better than an Oscar or Golden Globe, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's that's wonderful. And David, you. Before you joined Brookings, you were a, a journalist, a columnist for the Wall Street Journal for many, many years. When did you join the journal? Um, I joined the journal in uh, 20, uh, 1984. I spent 30 years at the Wall Street Journal before I came. Wow. Wow. And I remember we, we would talk, probably not, though, in the first 10 years of that. I, I was still in school. But I started in Boston, in the Boston Bureau, and I came to Washington to cover economic policy right after the stock market crash in 1987. And I spent 
all the rest of my career at the Journal in Washington, writing about economic policy, except for about a year and a half where I was in the Berlin Bureau of the Journal. Right. And I remember always getting nervous when you called, when I got a little, <laughs> a little you know. Why is that, Mark? You, you were, you were a tough interview, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it, you remember people don't remember, young people don't know this, but back in the day you'd get little telephone slips, right. And you, your the, the receptionist would uh, say so-and-so called and would write that and put it in your little box. You know, you had your little name there. And every time I come back from lunch and I see David's name, I go, Oh, <laughs> I started sweating. I, started I don't, sweating. I don't, I don't believe he it. Went, oh yeah. You were tough. You were tough. I don't believe this, but I'll take it. Yeah. You were great. You were very good. And I think we, we talked on and off for yeah, a long time, a couple of decades, few decades. And, and, and when did you went to Brookings? What? Four, I went five, to Brookings uh, at the very beginning of 2014 to be the first director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. And our mission is to improve the quality and efficacy of fiscal and monetary policy and public understanding of it. So I've been here for nine years. Is Wendy, Wendy Edelberg with you at Hutchins? No, well? Wendy is a colleague of mine in economic studies. She runs something called the Hamilton Project. Oh, the Hamilton like Project. Like a sister right, center yeah. of ours. Yeah. yeah, right, right. She's very good as well. And... Um, uh, are there specific issues, topics that you're grappling with right now? Is there things that are top of mind or is it mostly focused on monetary and fiscal policy, different monetary and fiscal policy we have, issues? A very, we have a very broad definition of fiscal mm. and monetary policy. So, okay. Okay. Um, you can talk about anything you want. Let's basically. see. Uh, yeah. I have a particular interest in place-based policies. I did a book on opportunity zones, which are a mm. provision of the 2017 tax bill that created 8,764 tax havens across the US. So I'm working with some colleagues to think about how, how do we evaluate all the various place-based policies? There's a huge amount of money in the recent legislation that's targeted at uh, sending federal money to individual to distressed communities. So that's one basket. Um, Can I ask on that, David? Are you, yeah. you pro or con? Because there tends to be two camps here on the opportunity zones. Folks I think really opportunity like opportunity zones are well-intentioned disaster. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that answers I think the that they, the bill was not crafted in a way to achieve the um, aspirations of the people who started it. I could talk right. about this a lot. Um, but on the fiscal monetary front, we're thinking a lot about, um, uh, you know, in the military, when they do an operation and it doesn't go well, they do an after-action report to figure out what do we get wrong? Mm. Um, the Federal Reserve does not seem to subscribe to this approach to retrospectiveness. So we're mm. gonna, we're thinking about doing it for them. Oh boy, that sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, let me ask you now that you're on that topic. While I have you there, uh, what do you think of their policy this time last year? When they, you know, it's hard to remember back, but. The funds rate target was still at the zero lower bound this time last year. Well, I think I'm not alone. And actually, I've heard Jay Powell acknowledge this, that they were late. So uh, they should have raised interest rates earlier. I think, uh, obviously, there's a lot of with a lot of uncertainty about how the pandemic would play out. But by March 2021, uh, we knew a lot about the pace at which the economy was rebounding and that we saw vaccines. And importantly, the fiscal policy response in March 2021 was, and you can see this in the minutes, much bigger than the Fed anticipated, and they didn't adjust either their rhetoric or their policy. Um, I give them a lot of credit for once they figured out they were wrong for catching up pretty dramatically. Um, I mean, uh, four and a quarter uh, percentage points in one year and raising interest rates is pretty is not something we've seen before. Um, and now we get to a really interesting question about when should they stop. And maybe we can come back to that. Uh, that'd be a good topic. Uh, you know, today, uh, uh, this week, we got the uh, consumer price inflation report, CPI report. And that's uh, been uh, kind of top of mind at the moment. Uh, so we'll dig into that and um, talk a, a lot about the different macro issues, job market, monetary policy, and the thing that everyone wants to know, are we going into recession? Uh, uh, and then at some point we're going to play the statistics game, David, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be willing to play that game. Uh, nice way to kind of digest some tough economic statistics and we'll do that. 
Um, but uh, let, let's get down to it and go right to the CPI report. And maybe Marissa, can you give us a rundown on your uh, take on that of that report? By the way, I thought it was a pretty good report. Not trying to bias your, you know, your perspective here. I'm just just saying. You could almost say it was to script or write in the strike zone. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I think it's exactly <laughs> what you would want to see. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> David. These are Zandyisms. They, 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 they know they know me well. Yeah, they know me well. Yeah. Uh, so go ahead, Marissa. Yes, it was a good report. It was it was a it was a great report. The overall CPI fell 0.1 percent month over month, and that was the first decline, at least rounded to one decimal place, that we've seen since May of 2020. This is the headline CPI. Um, over the year, prices are up 6.4%, and that's the softest year-over-year -year increase since October of 2021. Um, the main reason that headline inflation fell is energy prices, which are dropping very rapidly. They fell 4.5% uh, just over the month. They're still up 7% over the year. Um, within energy, fuel prices fell 17% over the month, so energy is really a the drag on headline inflation right now. Um, core inflation, which is stripping out food and energy, was up 0.3% over the month. That was a little faster than the 0.2% increase we saw in November. And over the year, core is up 5.7%. That is the slowest pace since December of 21. Um, it does seem like food inflation, which has been in the headlines quite a bit, is slowing. It rose 0.3% over the month, and that's the slowest pace of food inflation since April of 2021. This is despite all the egg headlines I'm seeing. Mm. <laughs> egg prices are up 60% over the year. That's the every article I look at talks about eggs. Um, cookies, too. Cookies. Cookies? It's a big uh, increase, too. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, well, I noticed white bread is up yeah. something like, I don't know, it's, it's up by a huge amount, biggest increase since 1974 too, but well, overall I, I, food the whole is, egg thing is a big deal in my household. My daughter eats like I, a, a gazillion eggs. I mean, like, <laughs> can't, you know, so do I, 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 I try eat to, an egg every day. I try to explain apples and oranges. Can we substitute something, you know? <laughs> She goes, well, what are you going to substitute for an egg? And she, I think she's got me there. It's I, a I fair question. Yeah. A fair the question. Egg is, an egg is a perfect An egg is an egg, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Um, right. So the egg thing. Yeah. So there's the egg thing, um, which is on everybody's mind. But overall, all food, and this is food both at home and away, um, um, slowed over the, the month. Um, goods prices are also falling. So they've been falling for three st straight months. I mean, I think within goods, the thing everyone likes to look at is vehicle prices. So new car prices actually fell for the first time in a year. It was a small decline. It was 0.1% over the month. They're still 6% higher over the year. Used vehicle prices are really falling. They've fallen for six straight months and they're down almost 9% over the year. Um, Core services um, accelerated uh, over the month and they're up 7% over the year. And services- Including housing or not yeah, including? It? Yeah, and so this is, um, this is what the Fed is really keyed into, right? Is now they're looking at uh, core services, I think X shelter, excluding yeah. shelter. And we can talk about shelter. So shelter prices have been accelerating. They were up over the month, both for- rents and owner's equivalent rent. We think that that's going to soften probably in the middle of this year, just given the incoming like private sector data that we see on new rental agreements, which show softening and signings of new rental agreements. That's just going to take a little while to show up in the BLS figures. So rents are really key in the services sector, but what the Fed's looking at is things that they think they can control through monetary policy, things that are very, um, where prices are influenced by the wages that employers are paying to people. So they're really keyed into the, the service, uh, core services. Um, One thing there that I was a little confused about, and I actually saw, I don't know where I saw this, but I think, um, uh, uh, core services, including housing, was up. What was it? Point point five over point the month. Five. Yeah, and, and housing was up point eight. That's right. So yeah. the 
the services X housing felt like it should, it came in pretty strong. It was actually accelerated in the month. You know, again, that's what the Fed's looking at. So therefore everyone's looking at that more carefully. Just didn't feel like the arithmetic added up. Did that, I, I didn't go back and do the arithmetic. Did, and they must've gotten the, gotten it right, I guess, but this looked weird to me. Did that like not strike core, you? Right. Yeah. That was the core services X housing. It looked like it was a bigger number. They reported a bigger number than you would have thought given the components. I just, no, no one heard, no one didn't strike you. Odd. Okay. Forget about it. No, I thought it oh, looked yeah, okay. I didn't catch that. Okay. It, that would looked okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's still seven and a, seven and a half, seven point four percent year to year. Yeah. Right. Still strong. Still strong. Yeah. 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 So that's, you know, if there's one, one concern we have in the CPI report, it's just looking at these uh, service price inflation, because that's really where you, where you get into the wage inflation. And um, so we're ke keenly, you know, looking at wage inflation every time we get some metric that we can look at over the year um, or each month, whether it's the ECI or the BLS report that we saw last month. And it does look like wages are turning over, you know, they're softening a bit, but um, they tend to be sticky. So it can take some time. So, so what's so, the bottom line? What do, what do you so mean? Is the inflation, bottom line. Yeah. Bottom the bottom line. line is, I mean, in, inflation is clearly at the, right, uh, clearly softening. Price growth is clearly decelerating, Correct. and we see it across goods. We've seen the shift from buying goods to to services. You, you see it in goods. You see it in um, food and energy have been the main drivers of inf of headline inflation, and those are clearly softening. Food not as quickly as we would like, but even there, you know, a few months ago, we saw some softening in food inflation and we were reluctant to say this was a trend, but it's clearly a trend now. I mean, it's it's clearly decelerating, as, as, particularly as fuel prices are coming down, right? Because that's a big component of food inflation is just shipping and trucking food across the country. So I think it's a great report. I don't think, I think it's exactly what the Fed would want to see. I don't think it changes anything in terms of what the, we're expecting the Fed to do um, early next month. Their next meeting is in February. It will be before the next CPI report. So this is the last report they get before they meet in February. And we're expecting them to raise rates 25 basis points, which would be a step down from the pace they've been going at. Hey, David, you heard that kind of rundown. Does that kind of fit with your... I, yeah, I, I, don't... Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, Rissa has it right. It's like, it does suggest that the peak inflation is past and things are coming down. Uh, I think some of this is the normalizing of supply chains. I mean, used car prices were down now six months in a row. Um, I'm kind of intrigued by the Fed's focus on wages. The Fed seems to think that... Uh, uh, Powell said at a thing we had here about a month ago that the pace of nominal wage increases is too high to be consistent with meeting their target. And of course, wages are going to be pretty important in the service sector. So I, I, what I'm really curious about is how, what kind of signal they send in February. Are they sending a signal like, we think we're winning the war and we can relax? Or do they send a signal saying, look, we're making progress here, but we're not going to we're not going to relent uh, until we actually see more tangible evidence that prices are uh, approaching our target. And I don't think they're there yet. Yeah. Hey, Marissa, do you know, when do we get the employment cost index report? That, that We don't get that until after, that's in February sometime, right? Uh, that's the quarterly series from BLS that controls for mix in occupations and industries. So it, it, we're not going to get that for a while, I think. Is yeah, right? I'm I'm looking at it right now. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll come back to you and I'll tell you the date. Okay. But yeah, I don't I don't think that they're going to get it Mar right before the March seventeenth. I think. Oh, March seventeenth. Oh, no, no, 17th. I'm sorry. Wait, take it back. Employment cost index for December twenty two is scheduled to be released on January thirty first. So we will get. That oh. Before. Oh. Okay. Okay. Very good. Just in time. Yeah. Just in time. <laughs> Just yeah. in time. Because um, that'll be a key statistic. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, like. It's not very controversial when you have six, seven, eight percent inflation and your interest rates are at zero for everybody on the FOMC to agree it's time to raise interest rates. But now we're getting to the point where there's going to be some disagreement between people who are going to say, look, 
we have to err on the side of doing too much, even if that means we have a recession. And others who are saying, oh, come on, monetary policy works with a long and variable lag. We've done a lot. We're starting to see some progress against inflation. Uh, the markets think we're winning this war. And so we should not do too much. And I think we'll begin to see that tension uh, in, you know, I think it'll spill over some in public soon, uh, but certainly it will be going on inside the Fed as we get more into 2023. Well, well, it almost feels like that's already started, right? I mean, you saw Pat Harker, the Philly Fed president, kind of put a stake in the ground supporting quarter point rate increases going forward. He says 50 basis points are 75, certainly, and now 50 is done. We're going to quarter point. Right. right. But I think the question is, uh, what do they think the what people call the terminal rate is? How far do they have to take it? And we won't know, they won't put a number on it until they do their next uh, uh, public forecast. But I think there, there will be some disagreement. How many quarter point increases? Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, six, yeah. I think. And I think it, uh, you know, it'll depend a lot on what's going on in the economy. Uh, one thing that if I were them, I'd worry about is um, they're really going to be, this, this is taking us in another direction. You don't know if you want to go here, but if there's a fight over the debt ceiling later this year, that could be very disruptive to the financial markets and to public confidence in the economy. And if I were at the Fed, I'd want to get whatever I was doing done before that happens. So I don't have to be raising rates uh, in the middle of that mess. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, so that, that would argue for what? A, a somewhat higher terminal rate sooner rather than later? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. Let's come back to that um, it, before we go down that path. Chris, is there anything else you wanted to add on the CPI report and also what it might mean for the conduct of monetary policy? Oh, sure. I think uh, Marissa summarized it uh, nicely. One asterisk I might put it, uh, around the energy is that uh, although energy prices, gas prices came in, energy services actually went up. So electricity prices, you know, and there's some volatility there, of course, but you know, if I think about the household balance sheet, households are still feeling the pinch in terms of um, their utility costs. And those do take some time given regulations to to filter in as well. Um, I think the rent and owner's equivalent rent, you know, obviously there's some volatility there as well. It's not a great thing that they bounce back up. Now we do expect to see the general trend downward, but I think that may color the uh, the Fed's a decision here in terms of how aggressive, certainly it takes rate cuts, I think, off the table until we see some decisive uh, declines there. Um, but it may bias, you know, uh, to David's point, uh, maintaining a higher uh, uh, rate uh, for a longer period of time. So that plus the, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, services X shelter number, I think also would argue for you know, somewhat higher uh, rates for an extended period of time as well until we really see that coming in. You know what the report did for me? <clears throat> it didn't change my forecast for inflation. Uh, you know, I expect that to come in over time, get back to target sometime kind of mid 2024. That didn't change. But it's make, I'm increasingly more confident in that forecast. I feel pretty darn good that that's going to happen. I mean, assuming oil prices don't spike again, and that's obviously a risk, and assuming the pandemic doesn't take us in a, a direction it hasn't so far and China can get back, the, the supply chains can can normalize here as China winds down its no COVID policy. It just, it, it, we, we, you know, the, the rent and housing costs, we, we, that's, that's in, increasingly in cement and it's going to show up in lower cost of housing services here later in the year. And the labor market's cooling. I mean, it's, it's very clear it's cooling and wage growth has rolled over. So, you know, there's a lot of script to be written, and that's a Zandyism. I've said I say that all the time. Lots of script, but the script feels like it's increasingly indelible ink to me. I guess I guess no one writes with ink anymore, but you know, you get my drift. You get to my, so, my do you think we're gonna have a recession or not, Mark? Uh, pregnant pause. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to say it depends. <laughs> well, no. Uh I think the probabilities of a recession are high, you know, kind of an NBER defined recession are high. I put them, I, I, you know, this sounds like a cop out to some degree. It is 50, 50. I, I I'd say that, you know, I can see it going either direction. I wouldn't argue with anyone who says we're going into, well, with Chris, I would argue, but you know, most other people I would not argue, 
But, you know, I, I have to pick a side, you know, because we produce numbers that we put into databases that clients use, like JP Morgan, B of A, Wells Fargo, when they do their loan loss provisioning, they need numbers. So we've got to put numbers in a, in a, in a database. So um, we, we have no recession in our, uh, in fact, Chris coined the term. I, I'm curious, Dave, what do you think of this? Slow <laughs> session. Oh. Slow yeah, session. Seen that. Seen Not, that, yeah. What do you, what, Chris, you want to define slow? And, and actually, Chris, enterprising enough, he went out and bought the URL, slow session. Oh, geez, really? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Did you exactly. buy it with your money or is it a movie? No, no, his money. Money. <laughs> his money. His money. His money. I took a one year, for the team, me. right? Yeah. Yeah. I put Mark's paper there even. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, no, no, but we, I, I, I want to come back and we're going to ask you. I'm going to put you on notice now what your probability of recession is, you know, over the next 12 months and see if you want to go, if you want to answer that question. But, but to me, it feels like the inflation is coming in here and I can, it just feels, I'm just more confident, much more confident in that forecast, you know, going forward. And that certainly has implications for monetary policy. Um, so, so David, do you, when you think about, these questions that you asked, you know, what is the terminal rate? You know, how much higher do they have to go? Half point, quarter point. Do you have it? Do you have your own kind of expectation and forecast? I mean, if I asked you, David, what do you think the terminal rate is going to be? Do, so you, I, do you have a view uh, on that? I, I, uh, yes, although I would put more like guess than forecast, if you don't mind. <laughs> well, so it's, it's I, all it's I, all a guess. It's all a flavor. I think, of guess. I think they're going above five percent. I would say five and a quarter, uh, if I had to put a number on it, um, and maybe even five and a half. And I'm kind of surprised by the market's expectation that the Fed will be cutting rates by the end of 2023. That suggests to me that the markets must think that inflation is going to come down pretty substantially and that the unemployment rate will go up a lot. And so the Fed will feel the need to um, to ease. Uh, I think from if you look at the Fed's uh, summary of economic uh, projections and you listen to what Powell in particular says, they pretty much think the unemployment rate is too low and they want to drive it up. And so that leads me to believe that they will be a little bit tighter than some people think. Um, so, so the terminal rate is you wouldn't argue with five the market. And, five and a quarter, five and a half. Yeah, that that's kind of what's embedded in the market right now. But you're, right. but the market, okay, but the market it, thinks they're going to. Some yeah. people at least think it's going to cut by the end of the year, and I think they'll hold it there for longer. Right, right. I think that, that one thing that, um, there, I think all the recent fiscal action has kind of made the Fed push up the terminal rate a little bit. Um, but they also have we must have a great deal of confidence that we're not going to get any more fiscal policy in this Congress. I mean, we'll be lucky if we can uh, keep the lights on. So that that makes it a little bit easier for them because in the past they've like been constantly. We've all been surprised at how strong the how much federal spending Congress has approved. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, let's go back to the debt limit, and uh, that's the, kind of the other big news over the past couple of weeks. And I guess the angst here has risen in significant part because we've observed the kind of high level of dysfunction uh, in uh, uh, recently in Congress, uh, given the difficulty uh, Republicans have had um, you know, coming up with a speaker. Um, how big a deal do you think this is? How worried? should we be about a breach of the debt limit, do you think? I think we should be worried. I think that um, there it's always been, uh, people have often seen this as a lever to get something out of the administration or the other party. Um, but usually they've been uh, willing to play the game of chicken and at the last minute they flinch and they take some face-saving move. And the problem is this time, it may not be so easy to find that faith saving move. And there are Republicans who believe that like, we should just, well, it's not as bad as everybody says they're trying to scare us, we should just do it. Um, and so my best guess is there's gonna be a lot of tension, a lot of noise, uh, people will be very nervous. Um, the the treasury is about to hit the debt ceiling any day now. And then they'll use this extraordinary measures thing where they kind of, move money around to avoid not being able to sell bonds. But sometime in the summer or the fall, they won't have enough money to pay the bills and they won't be able to borrow. 
my if I had to guess, and this is even less sure than my guess on the terminal rate, my guess is that they'll they'll fail to raise the debt ceiling. There'll be a huge market reaction, and they'll come to their senses forty eight oh, hours goodness. later. It'll wow. be like the TARP vote, uh, where they, they did the wrong thing, and then the market reacted negatively. Um, Kevin McCarthy made some noises recently, the new speaker, suggesting backing away from the idea that we're willing to play this game of chicken. So that I took that as a hopeful sign. But and I think one really interesting question is, well, how did the Democrats play this? Um, the Democrats in, could come to the rescue of the Republicans and ra raise the get this debt ceiling out of the House and then it'll pass the Senate. Um, but they will probably wait till the last minute to do that. And so there may be a lot of tension about what do the Democrats want if they're going to vote for a debt ceiling increase or what do the hardcore Republicans want in exchange? So it's all it's very confusing. But uh, there are a bunch of people in the House of Representatives who are more interested in tearing down things than good policy. And with such a small margin, it, it, people are going to be very dangerous this year, I think. Just to make sure I got it right. So you think the most likely scenario is that we actually breach the debt limit? I would say that I would give, I would say I'm a pretty narrow. I would say 45%, we have a big showdown. They flinch at the last minute and we don't go over. 55% or maybe 60% that they actually can't come to an agreement. There's a crisis. The government says we can't, we can pay the bondholders, but if you don't do something by Tuesday, we can't write social security checks. That would be so upsetting to the markets that then they'll scare the pants off the uh, Republicans in the House and they'll do it. That's my that's my guess. This is yeah. based on very little reporting and just trying to read the body language. And a lot depends on what happens over the next couple of months. I mean, is everything a fight in the House or do the does the House manage to... Um, like they score their points and then they get on to doing business. I don't think we really know yet. Yeah. And of course, there's always a possibility that McCarthy loses uh, a person or two. Maybe George Santos resigns and is replaced by a Democrat. And then it makes it even harder for him to push something through without the Democrat support. And if he needs the Democrats, then it'll be much more likely to be a, a, a truce rather than a Armageddon. Right. You know, there's a, when, whenever we have this uh, debt limit, we come up to the debt limit, uh, the discussion uh, uh, quickly goes to what can be done to get around the debt limit. And you always hear these different ideas. I'm just going to throw two of them out there and see, get your reaction. The first is the 14th amendment. Uh, so that was a, uh, uh, an amendment passed during the civil war. And there's a clause in there, uh, I think section four, if you read it, it sounds like it gives authority to the uh, president to, uh, continue to pay on the debt. So if there's a debt limit breach, he can say, I'm evoking, you know, uh, the 14th Amendment and we're going to keep tre Treasury, keep paying your bills. The other is the so-called platinum coin. Uh, and in some legal uh, language, the, the, the executive advance has given authority to issue uh, platinum coins of any uh, amount. So the, the thought is, oh, they could issue a, a trillion dollar coin, have the Fed effectively buy the coin for a trillion dollars and the so-called seniorage, the difference between the trillion dollars and the cost of producing the coin, which is, you know, inconsequential is cash that the treasury can use to pay its bills. What do you think of those? And I, and, you know, it's actually gained some traction. I think back in, I, I'm making this up, so I might not have exactly right, but, you know, like a Paul Krugman, you know, another Nobel prize winner, you know, endorsed the idea, I think of a platinum coin, I believe, you know, in that, in that kerfuffle over the uh, over the uh, debt limit, what do you I, think I of think, those ideas? I think they're fun to talk about, but I find it really hard to believe that they would do them. Um, but I don't know. Uh, you know what you're saying is, if Congress fails to act, will the administration do something of that they can't be sure is legal and figure we'll figure out the law later? Um, one thing I'm sure of is they're going to say we can't do this. Because if they said they can do sure. it, then Congress can be irresponsible. Um, but I think they're kind of gimmicky. And I think especially anything that involves the Fed is really um, unlikely because uh, the Fed is going to be reluctant to say, decide with the president over Congress for something Congress should do. So I think that, but I mean, I'm sure that they're, they're dusting off those old memos and saying, what do we do if? But my guess is that 
uh, they won't do that stuff because it really does start to look like a banana republic more than Chris, we are already. Chris, do you have a view on that, on those uh, that question about the 14th Amendment and the on the uh, platinum coin? It's it's a tough one, right? If we really do come down, you know, I can't. It's hard to even contemplate what that financial Armageddon looks like if we're not able to make good on our payments. So, I think we would start looking at those other uh, other options if it really came uh, down to it, right? I'm assuming that if we go over, we get the Armageddon is relatively short lived. That it's so disruptive that they do it so. If social security checks go out a day late, it's disruptive. Um, it's not the end of the world. I don't think it can go on for a month. That would it would that would really be like time to emigrate. Yeah, but even the legality <laughs> of you know, that payment prioritization is yeah, no, it's a big issue. Right? Yeah. So we know a little well, bit from the Fed minutes about what they were thinking about the last time about how they would do it. So we know a little bit about their prioritization thing. And some of it, I mean, I've heard. That some of it has to do with like, it's all well and good for us to say, oh, pay this one and pay that one. But their computers right. aren't set up like that. It's like right. the whole problem we had with unemployment insurance uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we couldn't figure out. Somebody said to me, well, the problem is the state unemployment system computers is they can add and not multiply. So we had to add $600. And yeah. Couldn't say we're going to pay 100% of your wages. I didn't know I, that. Um, That's interesting. Crazy. I think yeah. any of us who work, worked in any company that has it turns out that software doesn't always do what you think. Oh, surely you thought of this. <laughs> well, in, in 1979, there there was a case that was a, a kerfuffle around the right. debt limit. They they actually increased it in time, but there were they couldn't get the computer code to uh, settled, and they actually the treasury actually missed a treasury bill payment. Right. right? right. And there's good academic research that showed just that little miss resulted in tens of billions of dollars of taxpayer cost because of the, you know, you multiply one basis point, you know, one one hundredth of a percentage point times, yeah you know, 31 trillion in debt. That's real money. That's real no, money. No, there's actually, there's a GEO report about the last, I think it was 2011, where they actually didn't go over the thing, but the speculation meant that right. people were afraid to buy really short bills and that the yield on those went up and that that's a lasting cost. Yeah. yeah. I, and of I course, just, the whole thing is is outrageous. I mean, Congress yeah. has approved the spending in taxes, and now the credit card bill has come, and they say, well, maybe we won't pay it. I mean, it's just, if you want to do something, what I find most frustrating is we do have some fiscal challenges, and Congress should address them, but this becomes an excuse not to address them. We'll fight about the debt ceiling, and we won't talk about how do we put Social Security and Medicare on a sustainable path, or whether our revenues are sufficient to pay the expectations of what government we want government to do. And that's what's unfortunate. And this does not look like a Congress that will be having thoughtful, long-range fiscal planning discussions. No. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, I, going back to the platinum coin in the 14th Amendment, even if the, they just, the president decided to go down that path, two big problems. First is investors aren't going to take much solace in that because right. they're going to say, you know, good chance that gets struck down pretty fast by the Supreme right. Court. Then what? And by the way, I'm, I'm out of here now because I'm not going to stick right. around for that. So you're going to see markets lose their minds anyway. And the second thing is you're mucking with the DNA of us, of our entire political system, right? Because it goes to the checks and balances between the executive branch and the Congress around, you know, the, who, who, who has the power of the purse and also the independence of the Fed. Can you imagine asking yep. them to cash in a platinum coin? And then what happens to the Fed in that situation? Exactly. So you're, you're, exactly. you're really messing with the uh, the the, the you know a D, the dna here so the unintended consequences of all of that would be i think you know pretty consequential i can't can't imagine that that happening but that's interesting i, I mean i uh I, I think if we have that tarp moment you know they kind of went across and someone did not get paid my guess is it would be the electric company <laughs> that wouldn't get paid it's it's not gonna be if they can do it you're right if they can do the, yeah, the switch the, the thing, code the really, it's sort of interesting to think about, so what's a smart strategy if you're a Democrat on this thing? We know that when the government shuts down, that the, the Republicans have learned that it's hard to blame that. They always get, they got blamed, you know, that mm, the famous yep. times in the past. Mm -hmm. And so the Democrats will be in a very interesting uh, political strategic position. Do we 
to what extent do we say, oh, this is too dangerous, it's going to cost the federal government money for the rest of our lives, we're going to make the Treasury security look less secure, so we're going to, like, uh, help them out? Or do they sit there and say, okay, let's see, let's watch you guys twist slowly in the wind, and then after 36 hours, we'll rescue you. I mean, remember, that's essentially what happened with TARP. That, yeah. That, that, and they made a few cosmetic changes, and then they passed it, but... Um, but I honestly, I don't know. It's and but it's going to be such a waste of time. I mean, I um, I've already started getting questions about this, and we've dusted off all the explain. The only good thing is we wrote all the explainers before. Yeah. So I just sent them. <laughs> we, we updated some numbers and dates, and here you could read yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's very frustrating, and I know um, that uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is just she's just frustrated that she has to. We have to constantly go down this path this. every time. Yeah. 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 Well, I think Jay Powell, the chair of the Fed, actually became a fixture in Washington in 2011, yeah. wasn't it? Around the debt limit. He went around explaining to the yeah. Congress of the time. He was at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Yeah. Not, not he, Brookings, not Brookings. But, no, yeah, and he was pretty at the good. Bipartisan Policy Center, and they've done a really good job over the years of keeping track of the cash flow of the government and putting dates on when has it really run out. And Powell was there. And the Obama people realized that if they needed someone to go talk to Republicans, that he'd be a good candidate to do that. So he did spend a lot of time trying to t convince Republicans that this is nuts. And I think that's one reason why the uh, Obama put him on the Fed, that Geithner was impressed with how well he handled that. So uh, it's just interesting how that yeah. how moves like that can can change your career. Now look at him. Right, or change the nation's history. Right? I'm sure that I'm yeah. sure that at the time, if you said to Jay Powell, "What are the chances that you'll someday be chairman of the Fed?" He'd say, exactly, a number less than zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially because he would have said, "Oh, I'm a lawyer. I'm not one of those PhD economists." Yeah. Right. So when does that happen? Uh, but but yeah, very interesting. Okay, let's play the statistics game. I think this is a good place to do it. And the game uh, for yeah. listeners is uh, everyone. Puts forward a statistic. Uh, the rest of the group tries to figure that out through questions and clues and deductive reasoning. The best que the best statistic is one that's not so easy we get it immediately and not so hard that we never get it. And if it's apropos to the conversation, the discussion, that that's a bonus. So uh, that's the statistics game. And I think, Marissa, I, it's now tradition for me to start with you when Dante's not on. So, uh, <laughs> Marissa, would you like to go? Sure. Can you hear me okay? I had to switch my mic. Yeah, you sound great. Yeah. Okay. All right. I have some construction going on behind me. Um, all right. So my number is... Literally behind you? Construction is literally going on behind yeah, you? Yeah. my I'm renovating my house ah. outside of my house, and they're here, and they're power washing Pounding something. Away. Yeah. Got it. Okay. It I actually power washing. have... Uh, it's Mark's favorite. Power washing. <laughs> David, do you have a power washer? I do not. Right. I yeah. highly recommend you get a power washer, <laughs> yeah, particularly, you know, for, you probably can get it cheaply at the moment. And then for the summer months, it's a very therapeutic thing, blasting water. Cause at get, anything, at anything you get, you get instant gratification because it, you know, you gotta be careful not to destroy things, but you know, yeah. barring that, but uh, highly recommend it. Uh, uh, but anyway, go ahead, go ahead, Marissa. <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Okay. Here nor there. So um, there's actually two, that I'm that I like and I'm having a hard time deciding okay I'll do this one seven in December whoa 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 seven no units to seven seven is it's is an economic <laughs> statistic seven seven percent seven oh, oh percent. there okay yeah okay. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry that's that was a hard. CPI number <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be seven. The number, the number of eggs I could find in the box. I was thinking, <laughs> the number of eggs the, uh, now dozen. and a dozen eggs. Yeah. The yeah. new dozen, seven. The new seven. seven. <laughs> yeah. uh, Sorry about that. Seven percent. Seven percent. Is it an inflation statistic? No, it's not. Oh. It's not in the CPI report. Not in the CPI. Okay. But it's not an inflation statistic. No, it's not. Okay. Okay. Seven percent. Is, is it a statistic that came out in the last week? Yes, of of course. Oh, of course. Okay, you play by the rules. Not, not like <laughs> yeah, me. Of course. All the rules. The one time, the time I did, I heard about it. So yes, it yeah. came out this past week. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> um, 
what do you guys think, Chris? Uh, I didn't see the University of Michigan survey, and I know that has nothing to do with 7%, I don't think. But what did well, there are inflation expectations there, but that's not if that was seven, I'd we'd run for the hills. It's not, it's not directly tied to inflation. No, it's the wage increase that Marissa wants Moody's to give (laughs) us. Yeah, and uh, David, how did you know we were in the middle of our conversation? That is interesting. You said that, yeah. (laughs) It shows insider information. It it? does, yeah. (laughs) Because this weekend, that's exactly what we're doing, which is incredibly painful, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wow. Setting wage increases. Um, uh, uh, Wow. Give us a clue, uh, Marissa. Okay. If I give you this clue, I think you're going to get it. Well, you'll get the report. So it's a a net percentage increase. Small business. Yes. So it comes from that survey. Okay. Comes from the NFIB small business survey it, well it's not compensation it's not price increases it's uh because i know those this 20 that's higher the net of that is higher yeah um seven percent are reporting they're having difficulty getting credit you got it oh yep david yeah. did you see wow. how i did that that <laughs> is done. that's amazing just saying wow. just saying it's amazing there's Close to amazing. so net seven percent saying that credit is harder to get So, and, and I picked this because it's the highest percentage since 2014. But it's still like, no, it's still 7%. It's a diffusion thing. It's a net, right? It's a diffusion. Uh, So more, more companies are saying it's harder to get credit than are saying it's the same or it's easier. And that is so, so it shows for small businesses, at least credit is, they're feeling a tighter credit environment more so than they have in almost 10 years but you wouldn't characterize it as tight though would you seven percent like what was it uh in the teeth of the pandemic or mm. you know just the oh. context tighter she's saying tighter, tighter right tighter it doesn't tighter, do any... tighter than the prior month right so it's not yeah. a it's not a it's not a metric of how tight credit is it's their perception of how yeah. how their their ability to get credit compared to the previous would month. you guys mind if i take a quick tangent with chris on a topic that's related and it goes to bank earnings that were really are being released. You know, all these banks, JP Morgan at the top of the list is now putting aside very large reserves for loan losses. Um, and, uh, you know, JP Morgan just adopted a recession forecast. They call it a mild recession. I think the unemployment rate goes to almost 5% in this, in this forecast. So mild. And they put aside, a pretty large, I think it was $3 billion. I'm making that up. So I might not have it right, but roughly right. Um, and uh, they're doing this under the new C- the reasonably new CECL accounting standards that was uh, implemented by the big banks back in early 2020 during the teeth of the pandemic. And the idea is that you, as a bank, look forward, you have scenarios for where things are headed for the economy and everything else. And based on that, you... Uh, uh, come up with your loan loss provisions, what your losses are going to be and what your loan. And there was always, there's been this debate, long running debate, even before Cecil was adopted, that this would be around counter cyclical, pro cyclical. The former way of loan loss provisioning was definitely pro cyclical. You only took a, a loss in your provisions if you actually experienced a loss or it was staring you in the face. In this case, you're, you're forward looking. But this feels like, I'm not so sure. Is it, it do, you, do you think what's going on now, Chris, is, Pro cyclical or counter cyclical? You see what I'm saying? I, I guess it depends on if you think their forecast is an accurate representation or not. Right? Yeah, but now they're tightening down on credit now in anticipation of a recession in the future, and that is does that induce the, the recession? slowing in the economy? <laughs> right? That's pro cyclical, isn't it? Or is that not? You I think it's saying? a matter of it, you know. It, it's a matter of degree, right? Certainly it could be, right? Could be. If you if you turn it off completely, right? Anticipating a recession, you could turn off all credit, right? You're going to induce a recession, right? I don't think, even with uh, Marissa's 7% figure, I don't think that's the case, right? We're, we're moderating credit availability. We're cutting off some of the, the more risky uh, lending that's going out there, but I don't see a, a, a full-scale shift in terms of uh, really cutting off uh, a source of credit to most uh, businesses. Yeah, so I so, think it, it feels, oh, sorry, go ahead. So I, I would say it's still, uh, to my mind, I guess because of my recession outlook, I would say it's more counter-cyclical than pro-cyclical still, but 
No, by, by the way, I think it's counter cyclical in the sense that they're not going to, the JP Morgans of the world aren't going to be taking loan loss provisions in the later this year because they already took them. Right. Right. So uh, that allows them to provide, you know, continue to provide more credit for longer. It may be a reason why we don't actually experience a recession, right? Because they're taking their lumps up. up All right, wait a minute. I'm confused. So just because JP Morgan is setting aside a lot of money for loan loss reserves, does that tell me that they're going to be tighter in their mm, credit? That, I thought a, it was kind of more like, almost like an earnings, in a good sense, earnings management thing. Let's make a, we have a lot of profits now. Let's set aside money for the worst case. Of course, if we don't need it, we can always put it back into the income stream. That's what they do. So I, is there a relationship between loan loss reserves and where they are, what their willingness to lend? Well, in theory, kind of, sort of, if I'm taking loan loss provisions, I'm lowering my earnings, I have less capital. If I have less capital, then I'm going to be tighter in my underwriting. That's the idea. But in the case of JP Morgan, they're, they're not capital constrained, so probably not. You know, right. Probably doesn't, doesn't might be for someone else. Yeah, I guess. Someone else it probably would, but at least in theory. But but anyway, I sorry to take you on that tangent. I just That was bo bothering me given the these big loan loss provisions at the bank. <laughs> Chris, you want to go next? What's your statistic? Sure. It's uh, two statistics really geared towards you and Marissa. That's my clue. Okay. 4.9% and 9.9%. Is it related the to- The raise I'm getting and the raise Mark's getting. <laughs> no, no, no. That is dead wrong. Dead wrong. It's the- <laughs> ding, ding, well, We're not going down that path, but you, need, you, need, you shouldn't shed any tears for me, but maybe a, a tier, a tier, a tier. Um, is there some inflation related? Chris? It is inflation related. Is it in the CPI numbers? Indeed. Yes. Is, is that a year... is that... go ahead? What's that? Yeah. Is it a is it a month over month and the year over year of the same thing that you're saying? Nope. Or two different both, things. They are both year over year statistics. And they're different well, components. Not, we of know the it's CPI. not eggs because we've already established we know that. It's not eggs. Right. <laughs> it is not a component. It's not an individual price. That's oh. my next hint. Oh, okay, so it's an aggregate of something. Say the numbers again for 4.9 and 9.9. Positive, Chris, not Positive, negative. Positive, obviously. I'm just checking, right. given, you know. I would throw in the negative. If... Right. So so it's something like uh, 4.9 is. Um, year of your uh, growth in prices. Of commodities, less energy or something. How about, is it geographic? Like It is geographic. Oh. Oh. Dave's, David's good at this game. He's very good. <laughs> what are the two geographies? The West and the Northeast. Even more specific. Oh, so. oh it's uh, it's Los uh, San Angeles Francisco. is four point five. Four point nine. Yep. Four point nine. And Philadelphia. Yeah, Miami is nine point nine. Oh nine. Oh, okay. oh makes you're sense. associating cool. Mark with Miami. Well, there's no yeah. Vero Beach specifically. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you. My my I'm paying a, my inflation rate's a lot higher than you guys, and I'm getting my pay increases lower. So what's that? Oh, now you're giving him fodder for Please. his, uh, his yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> Chris. You yeah. get you get a cut of this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, okay. Well, well I, I those, actually noticed those are also the low and the high. Right. Across metropolitan areas. So, oh, I, is that right? Just to give you yeah. some sense. Interesting. That's I did notice that if you look at regions, <clears throat> the four broad regions, so overall inflation is six and a half percent year over year through December. The mm -hmm. high is the South at seven. That goes to your Miami. And yep. the Midwest was the low at six. And you said the low was who? LA? LA. LA. LA and San Francisco. <clears throat> okay. So, no, are these, do you know, is this, are these trends persistent over time or not? So like, is, is one region consistently at the high end? Mm, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, okay. uh, a lot depends on housing, uh, mm -hmm. rents, because that's such a big, you know, it's a third of the CPI. So if you're in a part of the country where rent growth is weakened, like in the, I'm sure that's happening in California right now. Yeah. Yep. In, in Miami, I, I bet it's still booming. People are still moving into Miami. So the rent, so I think a lot of it goes to rent. Some of it goes to uh, gas prices and how much you drive, right? So if you're in New York, you don't drive, but if you're in, um, you know, North Carolina, you do. Or uh, you. Wait a minute. Do they have a different market basket for each region? I don't think so. Yeah, I thought they did. Didn't they? Really? I thought they did. Yeah. Oh, or, uh, I thought that's how they came up. Yeah. Yes, they use the consumer expenditure survey yeah. to see to weight uh, to weight each component. I got. Pretty sure they do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so okay, okay, that was a good one. 
That yeah. was a good one. Very good. Um, why did you say it was for me, though? Miami. Uh, Miami, oh, Miami and LA. Right? Oh, yeah. Right. Miami and LA. No, I'm Vero Beach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, David, you're up. What's your statistic? Now Minus 1.7%. Is it an inflation statistic? It's inflation related, but it's not a not an inflation, not a price okay. statistic. Minus 1.7%. Is it a statistic that came out recently? Yes, it is. Um, uh, it's one we should know. Yeah. Would you be surprised if we knew it? Yeah, because I like, yeah, but it's not, I'm not going obscure here. You're not going obscure. Okay. It's not like Estonia. <laughs> <laughs> exports to Russia no, no, no. or something. It's the, it's the United States. Prices. It's yeah. the United States. Um, it's a year-over-year -year figure that came out in the last few days. Uh, interesting. Um, is it related to housing, house prices? No, because they're falling. Uh, is it related to financial markets in any way, equity prices? No. Or is it no? related to energy prices, David? No. Um. Last Can you give day. us a clue? Yeah, we, you're going in the you're you guys don't think enough about people. So people. we have we have workers in the economy. Oh. We do have workers. We yeah. do. Yeah. We do. <laughs> <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> Why claims? Uh so is it related to jobs? Yes. Employment? It is related to jobs. It, UI some, claims came out yesterday. No, no, it's related to jobs, but it's not a jobs count. It's not oh. a jobs count related to jobs. In the labor what, category. Oh, is that? Oh, is it real is it, wage declines? Real wages? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, uh, real wages. Seven percent. The year-over-year -year decline in average hourly earnings for all workers. I, I, I'm like I'm beating you guys badly here. I'm just saying <laughs> I'm beating you guys bad. That's a good one. So is that what? So how did you measure that? Is that average hourly earnings less CPI inflation? Is that what that is? I took the real earnings release from the. Uh, Oh, Labor real earnings release. Which is average hourly earnings minus inflation. Mm -hmm. Inflation, CPI inflation. Okay. So like in December, it was actually positive because obviously we had a negative CPI thing. So average hourly earnings for all employees increased four-tenths of a percent between November and December. But over the year, wages have not kept up with inflation. Either. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, that, yeah, that, that, that certainly has been a big weight. Fortunately, we've had all that excess saving that people have been drawing down to kind of supplement their real uh, declining real incomes to maintain their spending, but that's a good one. Okay. I, I got one. Um, it's three statistics all related. Um, it, it might be a, a little unfair, but I'm going to do it. Go ahead and do it anyway. This week. Is it this week? This week. This right. week. A little unfair. I like a little that. unfair. A little unfair. unfair. Uh, uh, three statistics 1.8%. If you get the first one, that should help you with the rest of them. 3.1%. And 4.1%. 1.8, three 3.1, 4.1%. Inflation related? Or all in, uh, Yes, they're all inflation related. It's the three-month moving average for of CPI, something in CPI, right? That's very good. You, I'll give it, definitely give it to you. It's the <laughs> annualized change in overall inflation over the past three months, 1.8%. So, okay, that, that's a big tell. What's 3.1? That's overall. That's the core. That's the core. Four. I only know this because this was one of my candidates for a number I printed. Oh, ah. <laughs> oh it's still, nicely done. That's good. Nicely that's done. good. That's really I don't know good. what the, I don't know what the four. You know what? That's a little tougher. And yeah, he definitely gets a cowbell. In fact, we're going to send this to you, uh, David. This <laughs> Please is... don't. I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to figure out what, what do you do with all these mugs that people give me? You know? This is a cowbell, <laughs> a David. It's Michigan not a mug. mug an Ohio State mug. <laughs> yes, please don't. David, do you want one with Mark and Chris's face no. creepily painted on it? <laughs> Actually, it's pretty scary looking. It is. Of course, our faces are pretty, my face is all right. Well, four point one. I don't know. What okay, four point one. It's it's, it's not in this inflation CPI report, but it's inflation related. It's important. Three month annualized change in Marissa average hourly earnings. Average hourly earnings. Mm -hmm. Average hourly earnings. Okay, think about those numbers for a second. Think about it. Chris. You think about them for at least three seconds. <laughs> yeah, one point eight golden. 3.1, that's 
core CPI inflation, that's within spitting distance of target, which by my guesstimation is two and a half percent. And 4.1, you know, clear deceleration, critical to getting service price inflation down like the Fed wants. So this is the last three months. The, the last three months, the, the economic statistics have been fabulous. I mean, that, that you know, it's not perfect, but pretty darn close, right? Yeah. One of my colleagues, Wendy Edelberg, pointed out also that when inflation was running really high, we didn't have to think about the gap between the CPI and the PCE price index. But since the Fed's target mm. is PCE, you don't have to get CPI down to 2% for the Fed to declare victory. So, yeah, I think the question is really whether is, is you know, these things tend to move around and three months is encouraging, but you could see some, we don't know what the next couple of months will be. A absolutely. And, and I don't think the Fed is going to, relax until they see something they don't want to make the mistake of having uh, stopped too soon. Totally, totally agree. And, and also they're not even going to let on that they're going to do that because they don't want financial, yeah. they don't want markets to think that this is over. Therefore go buy stocks. To I know it's like they have to be hawkish in order to get the markets yeah. to help them deliver exactly. on their target. I get me a headache. It's like a hall of mirrors. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah they're all looking at each other, but uh, okay. Very good. Okay. So let's, um, let's uh, wind up the conversation in this, David, we've been doing, I, I alluded to this earlier and we've been doing this regularly just to kind of sum up things to give people a sense of where we stand. What is the probability that the economy is going to go into a uh, recession, uh, a kind of a National Bureau of Economic Research defined recession, broad based across lots of industry, persistent, more than a few months, at least a couple of three quarters in economic activity in 2023? And maybe I'll throw in going into 2024, let's say over the next year. So uh, go with you, Marissa. What, what's your probability of recession? 50%. Oh, that's a change. Do you want it to explain? Is, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and yeah, explain. Yeah, come down a bit. 55. A bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I just think all the data, the job market is to script, for lack of a better term. I mean, it's clearly slowing, but it's not collapsing. Um, inflation is clearly coming in. I The 50-50, again, is because... <laughs> Some wild thing can can happen and often does that we don't see coming. And and like I've said, I worry about kind of the rest of the world when I think about what could go wrong. I worry about some ge geopolitical events, some escalation in what's happening in Ukraine, something that crimps supply chains again, you know, how China's gonna come out of the COVID situation they're in. Um so yeah, I'm, I'm down to 50% mark. I'm with you. And last week you were at 55. 55 and the high, yeah. the high point for you, I felt, I think it was 60% at one point, weren't it? I think it was 65. I think 65. it was right at like two-thirds. Oh, so you've come way point. in here. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Yeah. You're very data oriented. As the data comes in, yeah, you're not a hedgehog. You're a, remember you remember these for, hedgehog versus a fox? She's kind of yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I, yeah, yeah. I think I was a hedgehog. You you were a hedgehog. Okay. I'm becoming more yeah fox like. Fox like yeah. Since I say since that. the podcast I think. Yeah. I, there you go. Very good. Chris, what Chris is the bear of the group. Uh, where are you now, Chris? Two thirds. Ooh, so he's down again too. Yeah, because pretty you were significantly. At, you were you and wow. he is a hedgehog. Significantly, it was sixty eight. Now it's sixty six. <laughs> oh, you were at six. Weren't you at seventy five? You were at seventy five at some point though, not that long ago. I was at seventy. Seventy. At seventy. If seventy five shadow, but seventy was my official. And now you're down to yeah. sixty six. Right. Yes, two thirds. Can I ask you, Chris, if you were chief economist? And it was on you to decide whether we should have a baseline forecast that had a recession in it. Would you have one in it? So I, what uh, gives me, I would. You would. But I don't know that it would be an MBER declared official. I would have oh, the unemploy it. unemployment it. rate a little bit higher than what yep. we have. Yeah. Um, and with our slow session vocabulary, that's yep. really what I'm advocating. Uh, so Got it. that's why, but- Data dependent, right? Yield curve, leaning economic indicators, consumer sentiment, differential. You have a lot of negative uh, red flags still out there. That's why I'm sticking with a higher, higher right. level. Right. Okay. Very good, David. What's what's your probability of recession? Well, I 
if you'd asked me a couple months ago, I would have been in the 65% thing, but I've also come down, but I, I, I'd be more pessimistic than Marissa. I'd say, you know, 55% range. 55%. So more, I would put, if I were doing your forecast, I would put a recession in. You would. But I'm, but I'm, I'm less confident that we're going to have one than I was before, but for all the reasons we've been discussing. Right. The, the, just the data coming, the data stream. Yeah, the inflation is cooling off and the job market's pretty strong. So you could sort of, the, the softish landing thing scenario looks a little better. In, in, is your thinking that we go into recession just because of what's already writ, written in in reality here that we're going to 5%, 5 and a, 5 and a quarter percent, and that's Tiger enough by itself to push us and, in? And the kind of stuff we we're talking about, a bit of self-fulfilling prophecy here. If yeah. every business or if two thirds or 70% of businesses think we're going to have a recession, and so each of them does a little less hiring, a little less expansion, if consumers get a little more cautious, I think I, that's why I think it's likely. But um, yeah, but but I'm much more optimistic today than if you'd asked me two months ago. Two months ago, yeah. And David, when do you think that would happen? When do you think is the most likely point? Where we could go into <laughs> of course, the natural session? next question: What day, David? Please, <laughs> August thirteenth, two thousand. Mm. That works. Yeah, I, something like that's that. that's when the debt limit. <clears throat> yeah. I think that the, yeah. I think that the the MBR doesn't give. They don't have to have a date. They do have a month, right? Month. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. 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 And yeah. whether the NBR thing is kind of interesting. I mean, you know, we had a couple of quarters of negative GDP growth. It clearly wasn't a recession. Right. Uh, they the the COVID recession is so abrupt, so sharp. Uh, so I don't I don't I'm glad I'm not on that committee. But um, yeah, yeah, they got a good group, good group of a great group of folks. on. One that thing that, that I thought was interesting is if you read the latest Fed minutes, the staff says something like, we don't see a recession, but a recession is equally likely to our baseline forecast. So they're mm. pretty much in the- mm. 50, They're doing 50. what I'm doing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. yeah. 50, 50, I have not changed and I you know, still land on no recession, uh, but I feel more confident than I felt in a long time. The the data is holding up uh, you know, pretty well here. Sticking to script as someone is prone to say- um, well, I think we're going to call it a podcast at this point. I do want to mention one thing that's uh, uh, key, important. We have a uh, summit coming up, uh, the Moody's Analytics Summit. This is going to be in uh, early March. I believe it's March 5th through 7th. Someone can check that out for me. That's right. Is it in Scottsdale? And you're going to be there, right, uh, Marissa? I think- uh, And Chris, yep. And Chris is going to be there, right? So we're going to be, we'll be in Scottsdale. And our- we're talking about having a this podcast at the summit. I don't know if we're going to pull that off. Maybe I even shouldn't mention that, but uh, because I'm not sure. But that would be fun if we could have a, a you know do this podcast a live, live a, a live podcast. podcast. We we've done one of those and that was a blast. Remember, Chris? Yeah. That was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed. But that. without an audience, this would be a oh yeah, a this twist, would be with an right? audience. That would yeah. be really cool. Uh, but we we uh, hope to see you there. A lot to talk about, um, and uh, we'll. Uh, First in-person summit since the pandemic, I think. So wow. this is a pretty yeah. big deal for us. So we're, we're looking forward to it. So hopefully, hopefully we'll see you there. So with that, dear listener, we'll call this a podcast. Talk to you next week. Take care.